Well, good morning, everybody. So glad to see all of you here today in worship. We have guests with us. We're glad that you're here and others that uh, we haven't seen in a good little while, but have uh, been here before. We're glad that we're just sort of getting back together. It's taken forever, I know, and it's going to take a lot longer, but, uh, but at least we are together on Sunday morning. This is wonderful. Um, I don't have a lot of announcements to make. We are uh, uh, very pleased to let you know that the church is opening up for our uh, small support groups. Uh, I don't know if you know, that's one of our major ministries at the church where we're open for people uh, to come for AA meetings, NA meetings, other support uh, types of things. And so that's, uh, that this, this week they'll be uh, starting to meet and uh, the session made that, that determination. I just can't do that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm stuck that thing right down my throat. I tend to breathe heavy when I'm, when I'm preaching. Um, Anyway, so it's all, it's all good. We're just slowly taking little baby steps, so we should be, be pleased about that. Um, glad that all of you are here, and uh, let's turn our thoughts and our hearts over to God, and let us begin our time of worship. Join with me now in the call uh, to worship. Well, no, let's have a prelude first. Sorry. <laughs> Look at the bulletin. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Your law is perfect, O God. Your ways are just. Gold's value is nothing compared to the salvation that you offer. Let us worship God. One of the great privileges we have as the people of God is to confess what we believe, to make a statement to the world that we do believe. And we use today the great words of the Apostles' Creed, which are almost the oldest creed that we have. We use these words today. Join with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We welcome now Carol Kerfus is going to bless us with some music. Thank you.
Today, our scripture passages have to do with scripture. I know, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing we're going to do today. We're going to talk about God's word. And there is an uh, event that took place in the book of Nehemiah, actually the sixth uh, chapter of Nehemiah, when the people of God got together and um, listened and, to the word of God in a new and exciting way. So we go to uh, Nehemiah 8, beginning with the first verse. And we find these words. Now, the people of God had been in, and I'll mention this in the sermon, had been uh, away from uh, God. They had been away from their faith for a number of years. They had been rebuilding the temple. They were getting back on their feet. And, uh, but they had, in a way, forgotten who they were. And so this, this is what uh, Ezra does. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the word uh, to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Methuselah, Shema, and a number of others. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebith, and Jamin, and then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, excuse me, Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and scribe, and the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then we turn to uh, the, the Levites, calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. And then we turn to the Gospel of Luke, where we find Jesus uh, going into a synagogue in Nazareth. And we begin with the um, fourth chapter, the 14th verse. Fourth chapter, early on in Luke. So this is one of the first events. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, 
but to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet no one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Let's turn to God for a moment of silent prayer. Amen. Okay, do you like lawyer jokes? Yeah, I don't have any, so I'm not going to give you any lawyer jokes. But, but uh, just not having one's kind of a joke. But preacher jokes, they're everywhere. And, and I will tell you, I've, I've heard them all. I, I, some of these things just border a little bit too much on reality. One young preacher decided he was going to preach the best sermon ever, and he went on, and he went on, and 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 on. And finally, when he quit, he, he talk, made an apology to the congregation. He said, listen, I know that I've been up here for a long time, but, you know, a good sermon can take a little while. And besides, I, I forgot to bring my wristwatch. And one guy in the back said, yeah, but you could have brought your calendar. <laughs> now, the story in today's Gospel of Luke is not about a long sermon. In fact, it's one of the shortest sermons on record, and certainly in the Bible. He goes to the synagogue in Nazareth. This is where he had been raised. The people knew him. He had been given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and by the officer of the synagogue. And he reads from Isaiah 61. Here it is again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce the release of the captives and recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who have been oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he sits down. This is what you did as a, as a, uh, a rabbi. You would sit and, and when you were teaching. It didn't mean that they were finished. He wasn't done. That's the, the position from which you taught. Anyway, the Gospels contain lots of incidences where Jesus sat down to teach his disciples and others. And so he sits down and he says these words, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's it. That's the sermon. That's, so you go home, everything's fine. But, okay, interesting, but something happens. Our Old Testament lesson portrays a very different kind of situation on a very special day in the life of the people of Israel. The people, they've only just returned to the promised land after spending 50 years in exile in Babylon. They've gathered together in a square next to the water gate in Jerusalem, men, women, children, there to hear the law of Moses read to them and explained to them. And they get there early in the morning until midday, six hours. Can you imagine that? Six hours. How, how, Tim, how long do you think we'd have people here uh, coming to church if we had six hours of church? I don't know. That'd be, be, it'd be tough. If <laughs> one, yeah, me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it makes me squirm just think about it. Yet, that's not the reaction of the people of God to this incredibly long proclamation of God's word. In fact, it's just the opposite. They're completely wrapped up in it. They cry. They holler, Amen. They raise their hands to heaven. They fall down on the ground. They bow their heads low and then they pray. In short, they are completely involved in hearing the word of God. It touches them and it touches them deeply. When was the last time that you were touched by the word of God? So much so that it caused you to cry or to fall down on your knees or to lift up your hands in thanksgiving or to say with enthusiasm and joy, so be it, Lord. Amen. So be it, Lord. Amen. Yesterday, Deborah asked me to clean out a cabinet. This is a regular thing around our house. But it's a cabinet I hadn't been in in a while. And as I pulled stuff out, I pulled out my seminary Bible. 
It was a Thompson Chain Reference Bible at the time. It was kind of a new idea, a new thing. And I, I looked through it, and oh boy, it was flooded with memories. I wore that thing out, of course, you know, in seminary, you were using it all the time. But I made notes everywhere, you know, you couldn't hardly see the words in some places, because I'd scribbled this, that, in different colors and everything. It was great. And it put, made me want to go and find my other important Bibles, my, the Bible that my first wife carried to church every day, uh, every Sunday. Uh, I still have that. It's in a little case, and it's beautiful, but it's worn out. She was, she was a more uh, uh, dedicated Bible reader than I am. She's amazing. And then I have my, my old uh, Bible that's the uh, NIV study Bible. When I discovered that, it opened up a whole world of Bible studies for me. And if any of you are interested at the end of this sermon and you want to get an NIV Bible, I got a couple of them in my office. I'll be glad to give them to you. They're about 30 bucks a piece and I got them for like four. And you can, I know, I, you just got to know somebody. And since I know Jesus, I get them on a break. You know, I get them, I, it's good. Anyway, but, but my first NIV Bible, and I, I went through it, and I'm flipping through it, and a bunch of pages are torn and stuff, you know, and, and the Bible that I'm using now, which is on the corner of my desk, so I could just reach out and grab it, it's, it and, and it's starting to get a little worn, too. It, it's, have, have you worn out, how many of you worn out Bibles? Just raise your hand. You had to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you didn't get rid of it. You probably stuck it in the drawer like I did, because I can't get rid of it, ever, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and when you're reading the Bible and you're going through those wonderful words, does it touch you so much that you feel like you're, you, know, you get a, a feeling up and down your spine? Is something that is happening there? If not, how come? I mean, could it be that maybe we become just too familiar with it? Or maybe not familiar enough with it? Perhaps we simply lost our hunger, our sense of need, for something that is more, something that is divine, something, someone to help us and help make sense of it. It really is easy to lose our sense of wonder and our thirst for knowledge. Do you ever ask yourself what happens to our children as they grow older? You know, when they're little, what do they ask? What's the question every one, of, every one of them asks? Why? Why? Why is everything? Why is sky blue? Why do dogs bark? Why do cats feel soft? Why, do, why, 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 why? And you answer them, and of course, there's another why follow-up. Sometimes that's because they don't want to go to bed. <laughs> and so they're like, Dad, why do so and so? And uh, Michael, who lives in uh, Nashville, I got to visit him uh, last week, uh, still asks why and stuff. Yeah, Dad, Dad, why does this happen? What's, this, what's going on with this? And it, it's, it's delightful as a parent, but when they're small, it's not so delightful. It's like everything. Why is the sky blue? Because of, of oxygen. Why is there oxygen? Because we have to breathe. Why do we have to breathe? Because we're not fish. Why are, I mean, oh boy, oh, you get it, you get it. And you simply leads to more questions, and you get it. But of course, it's just a game sometimes. But what happens to that thirst for knowledge that children have? What happens to us? Is it, do we just get older and we just accept the way that things are? Do impatient teachers and parents stomp out the fire of curiosity within us? Or do they, or do we, for we are all, you know, once like our children, just kind of get used to things and stop worrying about it? Stop wondering? Is it that what, is that what happens to us when it comes to understanding the things of God? When it comes to exploring what it means to be, quote, chosen by God, when it comes to knowing that the word of God, what, what the word of God has to say for our lives right here, right now? Or have we just gotten used to it? Are we afraid maybe that there's no point in asking, that the answer is beyond us and beyond the ability of anyone to explain it to us? Or worse, are we afraid that we might well understand the, what, what is beyond us? That we might understand that answer and that the answer will call us to make a change in our lives that maybe we don't really want to, to make? And I think it was Mark Twain who said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that disturb me, it's the parts that I do. Yeah, it's challenging. For the people of Israel, the explanation for their reaction to Ezra's reading of the word is found in their lack of familiarity with it. And the awesome sense that they had when they heard it proclaimed for the first time in many, many years of just how much they had strayed away from God's will for their lives. And how much goodness from God's hands they had missed for so many years. 
And the people of Israel 2,500 years ago were aware a lot like us. They believed in God. They believed in a, living a good life. But they really didn't pay heed to what God wanted of them. To what was said in the scriptures. They didn't pay a lot of attention to what God wanted of them. Or to the promises that God made to them. And how it was that they could proclaim those promises for themselves and for their nation. And before the time of, is of exile, there there was a business to look after, the relatives to entertain, the living to be sought, and of course, some time to relax. The Sabbath worship was enough for some, but for the rest, just an annual trip. To go to Passover, maybe, a, or Yom Kippur, that was enough. So it kind of sounds like today for a lot of Christians when we call them c and E's, right? Christmas and Easter, yeah. And during that time of exile, well, when you're a slave, you can understand how easy it is not to have time to listen to the old stories, to pray hard each day and to meditate on what God has said, well, or what he'd written down and recorded in the ancient scrolls. You just didn't have time for it. It is enough to simply, is it enough to, to simply believe in God? I mean, it is, right? You don't have to pray. You don't have to pay attention to what he says you're supposed to do, right? I don't know how you're gonna answer those questions for yourselves, but it seems to me that if you have if you have heard that you, because of the sheer love of a friend or a relative, have inherited a million dollars, but you refuse to read the will to find out how to claim that money that, that the bank owes to you, what passwords to enter and what things that you have to do, people would consider you a fool. Whatever the score may be for you, when the people of Israel return from exile are finally gathered to hear the word of God, a word that finally had been put together in the very form in which we have it today, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, it was a great eye-opener for them. And listening to it, they knew the goodness of God. From the story of creation to the exodus, they knew the sin of their ancestors. From Adam and Eve to the story of the golden calf, they heard the laws God had given them for their own conduct so that he might bless them. And they realized just how far away from that they had become and why they had suffered so much and why their land and their lives were still so poor. And what did they do? They wept. They wept in sorrow and grief for what they had done wrong, for how they had offended God, and for what they had missed because of that behavior. I mean, do you know what God has to say about how you are living right now? About how our country is existing? Do you know what God has to say about working all the time and about the importance of worship? about why we should go and pray for our politicians every day, even the ones you don't like, especially the ones you don't like? Do you know what God says about gossip, about how it is bad as, as murdering somebody, or what God has to say about your outbursts of anger, your impatience, your worry about how things and how you can overcome those things? Do you know what it means, and I mean really know what it means to forgive? And that charging interest on loans, do you know that has been a... Uh, considered an immoral, an immoral thing for thousands of years. And that the holy book has never ever said in all of its thousands of words, God helps those who help himself, themselves. But rather, the truth is, it says it in the interpretation of just about every book that God really and truly only helps those who help others. Those who seek to save their lives will lose them. But those who would lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, they will save them. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of God who called you out of darkness into a marvelous light. See, the word of God is exciting, my friends, but it can be just a little bit frightening as well. Frightening when you realize just how much it has to say about how we are living and just how far away from what God wants us to be doing. And so the people of Israel... They wept when they heard the word for the first time in many years. For the first time in a long time, they really listened to what God had to say and realized that they were not the people that they thought that they were, and they were farther from God than they had ever thought themselves to be. And so they mourned. They mourned who they were, who they had become. They mourned and they wept and they prayed to God for help. And Ezra and all the officials with them, Nehemiah, the governor of the land, and the rest of the priests see them weeping and say to them something that we all need to hear once we have encountered the word of God, the truth of God. 
and we've discovered who we are and what we have allowed ourselves to become, they say, and I love this phrase, if you don't get anything out of this sermon, take this, this phrase with you. This day is holy to the Lord your God. This time is special to God. Do not mourn or weep. Go your way and celebrate. Eat the best food and the drink the best wine and share it with those who have nothing to eat or drink. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved. Do not sorrow. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. How many of you have been to church where you thought it was a funeral all the time? I have been to those churches. I, I've known the ministers who put those services together. And, and frankly, they're not a lot of fun to be around. It's like there's no sense of joy. There's no sense of excitement. There's no sense of energy. Tim, when you played that, I know that piece. I played that, I think, here once before. Because I remember it so well. It just impressed me. And it just touches me. Okay, It makes me happy. But then as soon as, in, in most churches, as soon as you feel happy, you know, the person next to you is like, yeah, calm down, it's all right, we're, we're Presbyterians, we don't do that here, you know. Yeah. I got the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but you didn't get it here. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the day of the Lord. It is the day for the joy of the Lord is our strength. It is an important day. For those of you who really hear the word of God, for those of you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for wholeness, and for salvation, right now is a holy time. For the word of God, which tells us how far away from God that we are, the word that even now is in your ears and which you can hold in your hands if you uh, cho choose that word, also tells us that God is acting and will act to deliver us, should we allow him to do so. It's just that simple. Praise God. It's just that simple. And so, my friends, the sermon that Jesus gave in the temple in reaction to the word of God, as it is found in the prophet Isaiah, is the same word that Ezra and Nehemiah and all those who understand the word of God right throughout the ages have proclaimed. Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the time of God's favor, of God's forgiveness, of God's jubilee. That time when debt is forgiven and the land is restored, when families are brought back together and slaves are set free, when the blind have their sight restored and the lame are made to walk. Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So listen to it. Listen to it with more than your ears. Listen to it with your hunger. Listen to it with your needs. Listen to it with your hope. Listen with a friend who can help explain what you do grasp. And then listen with the Spirit for those things that you do not. Listen with the Spirit of God that will give you for that purpose if you just ask him for it. The word, my friend, most certainly does convict us of our sin. But remember, that same word proclaims the saving love of God. And the more that we understand that love and rejoice in that love and allow ourselves to be filled with joy by it, the stronger, the more healthy we will become. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in God. Because God is here to save you. God is not here to condemn you. He is here to make you whole, not to strike you down. I remember there was a great t-shirt that a friend of mine had in seminary. I had a picture of this guy, and he's looking up like this, and there's a giant thumb over him. It's like, yeah, just, 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 just wait for it. Or just wait for it. God's looking to squish you. And, and we thought it was funny. and it, you know, Now look back on it. Maybe it wasn't. Because there's way too many people. That's the way they orient themselves toward God. Just waiting for the shoe to fall. Just waiting for the bad to happen. When the reality is God's saying, that's, that, that's not what I have for you. you know, and truly, if you want to go to hell... You will go because it will be your choice. You don't got to wait for God to squish you. You don't got to wait because that's not what God is all about. God is all about loving you away from that and to say, no, I have something better for you. Embrace that. Embrace the joy. Embrace the goodness. See, it's not a matter of wanting to be good because you're afraid. It's wanting to be good because the love of, of God and who you are. It's a, it's a lot, that's a whole other sermon all on its own. But the word is that God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son all to the world so that the entire world could be saved through him. To rejoice in him, to believe in him, to trust in him, to follow him. All of that so you will not perish. 
The joy of the Lord is our strength. The word of the Lord is our guide. So rejoice in the word. Read the word. Bless the name of the Lord through the word of God. Now, how will you do that? There are many ways to do it. Go on the internet and type in year-round Bible reading, and you'll get 30 suggestions on how you can read through the Bible in a year. My favorite way of doing it, and frankly, the way that I got through my ordination exams, is that I've been a musician my whole life. Do you know how much religious music is scripture? Yeah, I know the entire Messiah, all of Handel's Messiah, which covers all the Old Testament uh, stories. I'm reading through it, I'm thinking, yeah, I know these words. That's, that's a, I know where that one's from, I know where that one's from. And, oh, that's Matthew, I remember that. It's, 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 however you get it, find a way to read, to listen to, to encounter, and to grow in God's love through God's word. Let us pray for that. Loving God, we thank you this day for the gift of your son Jesus who brought good news to the oppressed and liberation to all of us who are held in any sort of bondage. We come before you in gratitude giving thanks that we were made in your image called according to your purpose and commissioned to do your will. Help us to discover gifts we never knew we had and enable us to use them in behalf of all your children. Yes, we are of one spirit and brought together through baptism into one body, your church. The church is called to be one body with different parts to make it function, and yet we often sever that one body with division and suspicion and fear and hostility. And in doing so, we take from one another what belongs to us all. Forgive us, O oh God, and by your grace, make us one again in Jesus Christ. Enable us to come together this day to explore the meaning of our membership in this body of Christ. Open your word to us as we seek your great love that is found there. Help us to embrace that and then to share that good news with others. We are humbled, but we're also somewhat embarrassed if we have not been as diligent as we could as attentive to your word. You are reaching out to us every moment of every day as a possible encounter with you. So, O oh God of great change, of invitation and challenge, let us hear your words to us this day. Divert our attention from those things that divide and misdirect our commitment and release us that we may receive your Holy Spirit. Transform us and we shall know a world transformed. Hear us now as we join our voices together in the great prayer that you have given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand? When we uh, uh, are after the conclusion of the benediction, Tim's going to bless us with some music. You don't have to leave. You can sit and listen to it. But when you do leave, come down the center aisles and go out to the front. That way you don't have to encounter uh, each other too much. And we appreciate that if you would. So now... And the power, of, oh, now next, what's next Sunday? Thank you, it's Father's Day, right. So we'll probably talk about something else. No, I'm kidding. No, we'll talk about Father's Day. I'm looking forward to it. I've been working on that sermon for a while. What a privilege it is to, uh, to share the word of God with you. But when it's a theme like this, I'm real excited about it. So I'll see you uh, next Sunday. We'll talk, do Father's Day, and uh, it'll be great. It'll be great. So now, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Now may God, who sent his son into the world to die for our sins, and plant in your hearts a song that will never die. And may the music of our faith make the whole world dance to his rhythm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Tim?
Yep. 